Hello, it's Nikki and welcome to a brand new episode. This is part one of a two-part episode because I'm going to be sharing today a episode that I've wanted to make for quite a while and it's quite a chunky one. I've got lots to say on this. So I've broken it down into two sections because as my clients always say, this is about implementing. This is about really going through the process. So I don't want to overload the situation with so many things for you to think about and you do nothing with it. So I would rather break it down and I've managed to break it down into 10 steps here. Today I want to talk about change and over my life, oh my goodness, we're going to get deep here, I have had significant changes over the years. Some I may go into another time, but one change I particularly want to talk about today is when I did my coaching qualification and this, don't worry, I'm not going to sell you like, just do these three things and you can be a certified coach as well. My goodness, far from it. But I want to talk about change because change can feel scary. It can feel like not the done thing. Everybody wants to talk about the safety and keeping things in line and doing the safe bet option. And I actually disagree with that because the safe bet option is only safe and is only great for you if it feels really good. So throughout my life, there have been so many times where I felt like I've been shoehorned into making a decision or doing something and actually it hasn't felt good it hasn't felt aligned and actually it's left me feeling a bit discombobulated at the end of it because I do believe that we have to find that safety within ourselves of what feels really good to us. So uh, one example I can give is actually speaking on stage. It doesn't, I mean, of course I get nervous, but it actually doesn't feel that scary for me. It's a muscle that I've learned and taken care of and nurtured and grown over so many years. It actually feels second nature to me. But I know so many people who would be absolutely terrified about speaking on stage and it's horses for courses isn't it I mean I think if I suddenly had to I don't know build a kitchen I might get there in the end but it certainly wouldn't be my zone of genius so I want to firstly say that if you're in a position where you are thinking about change at the moment or you've had some reflection time in 2020 that's okay It doesn't matter what age you are, what stage of life you're in. Sometimes we will get that niggle. And I guess this is my first point that I want to make, that back in 2012, I got the niggle. So so back in 2011, I turned 30. And up until that point, it had really been a mixed bag. In some areas of my life, I felt like things were coming together and things felt really positive. And then on the other hand, I felt like I was in some kind of trauma, basically. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much, but a lot of stuff had happened in my 20s. And it took me a long time to really process it and really think about how I wanted to move forward. And on one hand, I'd moved in with Matty uh, six months before and we'd moved into our first home and it felt really good. Finally, Finally, I wasn't living with housemates who were weird. And um, I remember living with this guy years ago and uh, he was some kind of functioning alcoholic. And oh my goodness, he was one of those, like his parents absolutely adored him and thought they were that he was their baby and actually had no idea about the severity of the situation and so many times I would come back if I'd been staying at Matt's when we weren't living together and he'd just be dancing in our living room in his pants and um, yeah it was quite a peculiar setup let's say so on a sort of domestic home life basis I was feeling really good. I was so content in my relationship and I still am. I'm really pleased to say, but it felt like a start. It felt like new beginnings. But on the flip side, I wasn't where I wanted to be in my career. I felt really stuck 
we'd had a lot of death in the family. We'd had a lot of things going on and there had been a lot of times where I'd had to really step up and put my own, I guess, my own grief or my own feelings aside and do the right thing. And actually, it took me a long time to process all of that and really acknowledge what had gone on. So I guess when you're at that point, and I guess having a big birthday as well of 30, it kind of cracked me open. It gave me that permission to pay attention to that niggle. Because if I'm honest, for a few years before that, I'd had that niggle. But maybe I'd ignored it. Maybe I'd I, I'd put it under a pillow somewhere and thought, mm, I'll leave that for now. Because of all this other stuff that was going on, I thought, no, I'll just put that to the side for now. I just need to put one foot in front of the other. Because, you know, when life does get tough sometimes, it can be really hard to find the time and the space to do anything extra, I guess. But these days, definitely at nearly 39, I have a lot more sort of coping mechanisms, a lot more things that I can use. But that was my first indication, I guess. Pay attention to that niggle because it kept coming up again and again. And it would come up in different ways, you know, whether I was saying that, I I guess it came up in my self-talk where I would start saying that I really wanted something And then very quickly I was like, yeah, well, that's not going to happen. Or I would see traits of myself that I didn't recognise. Suddenly I was starting to become really negative or I would get a bit gossipy or I'd get a bit cross about something. And none of these things, my goodness, am I proud of. And this is a long time ago. But I found myself going down a bit of a path that I thought, hang about, if I don't stop this, if I don't nip this in the bud... I'm going to end up in a place a long way away from where I was going. So in being cracked open, I was looking for alternative things. And I had found myself down the self-development route of going, hmm, what else is out there? Now, this is 2011. So we weren't really talking about self-development. And it certainly wasn't being done in a jazzy, branded way. It felt very dated. Everything was like how to change your life. It felt like something that you would do in private, that you wouldn't reveal to anybody that you were going through this moment. And it felt very sort of secretive. So with this niggle, Basically, I was looking to get closer to what I actually wanted from life. And I think we can sometimes all find this moment where we just plod along. We keep going and we keep doing the same thing again and again. And I was getting stuck in small talk and saying, yeah, you know, and another week rolls by and la la la. I didn't feel like I was consciously living. So what I was looking for was some kind of through line, I think, if I'm really honest. I was looking for something that was going to help me to piece together all the elements of my life. I was looking to find a way that I could start to have autonomy, that I was going to be able to have a bit more control. So the situation I was in at the time, um, throughout my 20s, I'd been a jobbing actor. I still am a jobbing actor. Um, But I'd been very much sort of doing that and going out and getting really close to things. I think that's another thing. There were so many times in my life where I would get so close. So I think I got down to the last two for Emmerdale. Another thing where I was going to be in this really big film and then it went the other way, where I got an advert and I was thrilled about this advert. I knew the audition had gone really well and then they called me back and it was all fantastic and they were going to pay me, wait for it, for two days work, £17,000. Now that's without tax and that's without, you know, my contribution to my agent or anything like that. But seventeen grand for two days work. I was like, this is insane. And I got the job and I celebrated until a couple of days later where I found out my agent hadn't told them what my age was or they didn't realise what my age was. 
And I had to be 25 to, it still pains me to say this, I had to be 25 basically to advertise alcohol on TV. So I had this money coming towards me and then suddenly it was taken away. But you know, if it wasn't mine, you know, you could say all these philosophical things, but it felt really, it felt like a real stinger at the time. So I was dabbling, I was moving in sort of, I was doing bits of nannying, I was doing little bits of speaking, I would get jobs in terms of an actor, Um, I was starting to do a bit of agent work so I was doing a couple of days there but I definitely felt like I was sort of waiting for permission, I was waiting for somebody to book me or hire me or say yes or get back to me and I wanted that sense, that niggle was telling me, Nikki you're going to have to make some moves here and you're going to have to be brave and you're going to have to take control of this situation. Yes, so I was looking for that through line. The second thing that was very apparent at the time was I had to pay attention to what I actually wanted. This comes up with clients all the time and this involves me as their coach sometimes being challenging. And I say that always with love, always with kindness, always with giving them the space and the time and the focus that they need. Because for a long time, I had been kidding myself what I actually wanted for life. So I would say things like, oh, you know, I as long as I do what I love, I don't need to earn any money. Or I'm not really bothered about um, having a routine because, you know, da, 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 da. Or, I mean, I would love kids one day, but, you know, if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, then, you know, it will be fine as well. And I had to really check in and pay attention to what I was saying. And many of the things that were coming out of my mouth were not accurate. In fact... I did want to earn a lot of money. I did want to have a big life. I did want to have children. I did want to live in my dream home. I did want to feel like I was living the version of my life that I wanted to have. And I wasn't paying attention to it. So in working through this process, I knew I had to start paying attention. I had to start paying attention and asking myself some really deep questions of like, what do you want? What is going to fill you up? What's going to be a good life for you? And only now it's funny as I'm saying that, I'm like, that's what I talk about on the podcast right now. I'm talking about markers and versions of success. I'm talking about how you can thread together all your different skills and talents and expertise all together and create this lovely patchwork career. And it's really interesting that until you pay attention to those things that you're already doing, then you can kind of move forward in this. So I had the niggle, I had the stuff like, "Mm, not sure what's going on. The second thing was that I had to pay attention. So that led me to a point to suddenly starting to become a bit more open. And I'd kind of heard about coaching because my auntie was actually a qualified coach. Even though I'd never sort of spoken to her about it, she'd shared a little bit about what it was about, you know, taking people from where they are to where they were going. But it wasn't necessarily a conversation that we'd had in terms of careers because she was working in a corporate setting and in education and I didn't necessarily feel like there was a crossover. So I still felt like corporate coaching was like a very separate thing where in fact, actually what she was doing was very close to what I wanted to be part of. Anyway, as often happens with these things, an email landed in my inbox offering a free introduction, a two day introduction to coaching. And I was still at that point where I was like, Saturday and a Sunday going out with people I don't know. Well, how am I going to be hung over? How am I going to have those hours and hours of time that I'm just watching TV or I'm just staying in bed with my man? Like, how am I going to, sorry, TMI, but how, how am I going to make space? 
for my own self-development. Like that sounds crazy. And I can't lie, there was a lot of resistance around it because the thing was, I knew that I had to do it. I knew, and this is what I've put as my kind of point number three. I knew I had to start moving and getting in some rooms if I was going to get the clarity that I was going to get. So Marie Forleo always talks about this phrase and her phrase is, clarity comes from engagement, not thought. And that is so key for me. And it's something that I've really tuned into in my own life. Like, of course I'm gonna have to get stuck in in order to make a decision. Of course I'm going to have to take it to a pen and paper and a big old mind map in order to get the clarity that I'm looking for. So sometimes people think that they can sort of almost be a backseat driver and go through the process without actually going through the process. So I knew that I had to get in that room. I knew that I would have to put my hungover self to the side just for that weekend. And with all these days as well, it was a commitment. It was like a nine till six on both days. And so I was like, come on, come on, future life. Let's go. Let's go and do this. And as soon as I arrived, I thought, oh no, this this is not for me. These are not my people. You know, there were quite a few men in really terrible suits with halitosis who were a bit creepy. There were a lot of quite passive aggressive women who would try and fix you in a moment. Um, There was a lot of jargon that I just thought, oh no, this, this is not me. But I knew that I had to be in that room. Because doing those processes, doing those coaching exercises, whether or not I was going to become a coach, and at that point, I had absolutely no intention of doing that. I was going for the freebie. I was like, I'm going to go and sit, I'm going to learn some things, and I might be able to use them in my own life. At no point was I thinking about becoming a coach. And actually, if I'm honest, I probably hadn't even checked out the website properly. Like I didn't even know that they did diplomas or what that would look like. I just kind of, I don't know, skipped past that moment. So I was there for the free two day event. Anyway, on the Saturday by the lunchtime, I was like, hang about, there is something in this. And if you've had any kind of coaching or if you're in the self-development world, you'd be like, "Uh, yes, Nikki, uh, this is not news to me. Like, I know this shit works, of course. But I didn't know and nobody around me was telling me that this stuff works. But suddenly something clicked in me of I could make this work for me. I could make this work for other people. I could have this skill that stays with me in my pocket and it goes through my life with me. Oh my goodness. Because actually throughout my 20s, as an actor, I felt like I didn't have any strategy. In fact, I was just hoping and praying and wishing for the phone to ring or for my lucky break. I hadn't even anticipated or I hadn't entertained the idea that I could be in control of my own destiny. I thought I'd have to be, have to be plucked from obscurity or Steven Spielberg would suddenly have to find her and go, hey, sweetheart, you look like you got a nice face. Do you want to come and be in my movie? Like, I thought that would be the case. Turns out I could start building my own career, but that's another story for another time. So I knew I had to be in that room. I was there all day Saturday and Saturday night I came home and I cleaned my house, like properly cleaned it from top to bottom. And Matt was at home. He was just kind of having a slow day. I think he'd just been watching films all day and just enjoying a bit of peace and quiet with me being out at this. And he sort of watched me clean the house. Not because he's lazy or not because he's like, right, now you're home, you can clean the house. But because he was sort of a bit like... In a way, I wasn't asking for permission. I felt like I needed to declutter stuff. I needed to shake up the energy. I needed to actually process what had gone on that day. So I did that. Sunday, I went back and I sat in the room. And the first bit, so the morning session, I think was more kind of exercises and way of exploring. 
And then Sunday afternoon became the hard sell. So when they bring out the prospectuses with the folders, when people talk about the testimonials or the kinds of ways that you can use coaching. And as the afternoon went on, I thought, oh no, I'm gonna have to do this. And this is what happens sometimes when it comes to making a change or it comes to making an investment in yourself that sometimes everything logically will say, you're gonna spend how much? No, what? But you've only just come across this thing two days ago. How can this be a thing? And in that moment, I had to put that logic aside because bear in mind, like I'd had no interest in coaching before this, but bizarrely, if I look back on my life, I'd been doing this. I'd been doing this as an agent. I'd been thinking about goal setting. I'd been making vision boards. I'd been doing it, but not really realizing it was coaching. So by the afternoon, I found myself filling in the form. Yeah, that form, filling it in and booking my interview. So at that time, they actually interviewed you to make sure that you were a fit for the course, which I think is a really brilliant idea. And so I did that. And also I realized that there was some kind of bursary so I could apply for that. Anyway, I had my interview, I think two days later, it was all very quick and it was purposefully quick because what they didn't want you to do was they, it was all basically a big selling pitch, wasn't it? They wanted you to be able to make a decision, to be able to progress forward and to actually do the thing. So whilst you're in momentum and I get it. And actually it wasn't a sleazy selling process. It was a bit like, look, are you in or out? And I kind of feel like that with my clients sometimes. I don't like this. Oh, da, 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 you know, emails back and forth. If people want to say, I'm ready, I'm I love that energy. Like, yeah, great, let's go, let's do this thing. So I had my interview, they accepted me onto the course, and also they said they really loved my flavor and what I was able to bring, and they were able to give me a bursary. So I did the sums and I then had to make a decision about what I was going to do. And this brings me on to point number four. And you will feel this in terms of your change. Does this feel like a good fit? And sometimes on paper, based on the things that I've just shared in terms of the evidence, so I'd had zero interest in coaching before, I didn't really know much about the coaching academy, all of these things, I knew that I was like, it uh, It had unlocked something in me. And I was like, oh, it's like I could see what it was going to offer. And I was nodding. I was nodding like, yeah, yeah, I need that. Oh yeah, and that could do that. And oh, that would be brilliant. Oh, maybe. And I think sometimes we can get fixated when we're going through a change on the fear or on the on the uncertainty. So it's almost like if you're buying a house and I've heard this so often where people go to view houses and before they go through that house, they have a really fixed picture in their mind. And they think, oh, you know, I'm really into cottages. And then they walk through into a new build and suddenly they go, ah, uh, this is the one, this is the, this is the thing, oh, right. But in that moment, if you're closing your mind off, you can suddenly, even though it feels right on paper, you can get really fixated and go, well, it's not meant to be because look at the tiles, look at the tiles in the downstairs bathroom, they're absolutely hideous. No, 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 no. I should keep, like, this isn't the one actually. Even though everything in my bones makes me feel that it's right, it's maybe not the one. Maybe I should listen to that small voice. And so, as I was making this process, I really had to pay attention and tune in to what my instincts and my intuition was actually trying to tell me and to not get fixated on the how or the why or the amount of time or any of that. I had to get stuck in. I had to remind myself of how that felt and the possibility. And I really encourage you to do the same because when you see things on the internet or when you've had your eyes opened in a different kind of way, it becomes much harder to squash that down. 
it's like that moment when you first go to, I mean, I'm going back quite a few years here, when you first go to a nightclub and then you're like, how did I not know about these places? Oh my goodness, like the way the music makes me feel and oh, what it's like you've unlocked something or when you first kiss someone for the first time, you're like, how have I gone through all these years of not having a snog? This is brilliant. So I had to keep checking in and going, is this a good fit? Is this going to give me what I want? Because the other stuff later, the money, the commitment, and I'll go into this much more in part two, it can all be figure outable. Another quote there from Marie Forleo. I guess part B of that point number four is I had to ask myself, what would happen if I stayed the same? What would happen if I completely ignored this niggle that I was having? What would happen if I didn't pay attention to what I wanted? What would happen if I just became more and more closed and shut off to any kind of opportunity? What would happen if I ignored whether or not something was a good fit? What would happen if I stayed the same? And actually connecting with that of staying the same and not living up to what I wanted, that went, that was when it started to get really serious. Because suddenly I had that dawning of like, oh no, I'm becoming that person I never ever wanted to be. I'm becoming that person that my 17 year old self would have gone, as if, like what? I was becoming that person that person that stayed safe and all of the things that actually conflicted with my values. So number five was checking in with what I was going to have to do. So when we make a commitment, when we choose to proceed with something, you have to be willing to check in with what you're willing to do. And what does that look like? So even though you might yourself have signed up for a program or a working with a coach or doing a course or retraining, like on paper, actually reading through the sales page and going, okay, great, it's six modules or it's two away days or this is how many hours per month we're going to get or whatever, that's only part of it. That's just literally the logistics. When you actually come to making the moves of paying the money, of telling somebody you're going to do the work, of saying no to stuff, or saying yes, regardless of when it feels hard, that's the level of the commitment. So I had to check in with myself and go, what am I willing to do? And am I willing to do this? Is it easier to say the same? Is it easier just to keep going, even though nobody knows what this coaching thing is? Is it going to be okay if I start telling my pals that I can't come out because I'm studying? Am I willing to let some friendships go? Big questions. And when I say let some friendships go... What I mean by that is changing up the way that I was living my life. Because at that point, I was going to any old house party on a night out. I was having cups of tea with people and lunches and dinners, left, right and centre. Like I had a really full social life. And not all of that was fulfilling. And sometimes I'd be like, oh, what? I've been out the last three nights. Do I really have to go out again? So I guess that question was, what was I willing to do? And what does that look like practically? And was I available to do that hard stuff? Was I available to make those choices? Because I think up leveling or going to the next level or living out your dreams or going for it, sometimes it's spoken about in a very glamorous way. And actually, it's not. (laughs) It's not all flat lays of your desk. It's not Pinterest boards. It's not brand new sexy notebooks. Sometimes it is late nights. 
Sometimes it is early morning. Sometimes it is about having difficult conversations with people and saying things like, when you say that, it doesn't make me feel good. Or realizing that actually not everybody's going to be happy for you. So just a few light things on a Monday, but I want you to think about change and I want you to think about what's going on for you and to know that I hear you and I see you and I've done it. And I think anybody who just talks on the internet about the glamorous sides or the solutions or the benefits and really focus on who they are now, actually I hope in me sharing my own process in this, you'd be like, oh yeah, I know that I need to do X, Y and Z for my business but I'm really scared. Or there might be those moments where you're like, I've never spent that much money on anything. And I've certainly had those moments in my own career. Like, um, for example, when I made the payment for the coaching, even though I had a bit of bursary, like that, that was the biggest payment I'd ever made at that point. That was a big commitment, especially as three days before, I hadn't really been thinking about coaching or spending the money. So I want you to know that what you're feeling or experiencing is absolutely normal. But also I want to urge you to really tune in with what it is that you want and give yourself full permission for that and really pay attention to it. And then ask yourself, what do I need to do? Because again, things happen when you're in momentum when you're making moves. It's always that thing, like when you start dating somebody, then suddenly you start being asked on loads of dates. When you're in a job, it's easy to get a job. When you're being asked to do something at work, you'll be asked in lots of different areas. That's about being in momentum. So I would love to know today, from part one, and part two is coming tomorrow, what have you taken away from this? And what's the question or what's the niggle or the little nudge or the kind of knee jerk that keeps coming up for you? Where are you playing small? Where are you squashing those feelings and ignoring them? Because I can guarantee you will be. Because 2020 has felt heavy. 2020 has felt like we can only be in survival mode at that time. And I've certainly had days or weeks that I've, I've felt that and certainly in my life as well where I can only be in survival mode, where I can only put my one foot in front of the other. But I urge you just to open one eye very, very slowly and take a peek and see what else is out there and ask yourself what you need and what you want and what the next step is for you. If I can help in any other way, please do book a free 15 minute session with me. I'm always here. You can go to my website, nikkiraby.com forward slash free session. If you've got any questions about coaching or what that looks like now, or if you're thinking about becoming a coach, I don't have a program to teach you how to become a coach, but I could help you with your personal branding. I could help with you, help you to put together this portfolio career. So any questions, my DMs are always open. Also do check out the free masterclasses as well. There'll be lots in there, nikkiraby.com forward slash free masterclasses. And if you like this, please take a screenshot, share it across social media because there will be some people who know that they're ready to make some moves and they're maybe not quite sure how to do it yet. So you could just be the sign that they're looking for. Thanks, Thanks again for listening. I'll be back tomorrow with part two.